So First Watch has been with Pinnacle from the very beginning. Uh, historically, one third of the people that attend Pinnacle are already First Watch customers. Uh, First Watch is our strategic partner for Pinnacle. Uh, we're very proud of that. And at the live event, they would uh, typically have a user group meeting, a booth, and a suite packed with drinks, snacks, and conversations that typically go way past midnight each night. Um, we look forward to getting back to that, guys. Uh, please now join First Watch president, Todd Stout, and his team for a high-speed user update meeting where he will share wonderful things that have been they've been creating uh, to help their customers lead their operations during normal times and through COVID. Todd, I want to thank you very much for your support and welcome to Virtual Pinnacle. Uh, Todd, you're muted. Thanks, Anthony. I appreciate that. And thank you, Mike, for helping me uh, unmute. And uh, I'll turn it over to you for a minute, Mike. Sounds good. Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. I uh, hope uh, hope you've had a, a good morning so far. Um, uh, Todd, if you want to go to the uh, the first slide here, we'll uh, we'll dive right in. Or second slide. Let's go to the second slide. There we go. There we go. Um, so we it, it's been a it's been a a rough uh, or a, an interesting uh, interesting time leading up to our uh, our session today. Um, wanted to introduce. There's Deb. Um, our, uh, our, our team for today. So uh, Todd Stout, um, our president, and I, I would point to the Hollywood Square that he's in, but it's different on all of your, all of your screens. <coughs> um, Todd is, uh, has been in EMS since starting as a stock boy, uh, working as an EMT, paramedic, flight paramedic, operations manager, uh, consultant, author, uh, educator, and, uh, and has been running First Watch now for 21 uh, plus years. And uh, Deb is our uh, product development manager. Um, a long history. I won't, I won't say uh, how long because we, we keep those things quiet. Um, in, our, uh, in our industry and has worked in uh, technology and the provision of EMS and has really been leading uh, some of the coolest innovations that our, <coughs> our team and our world has, uh, has ever seen. And, and I'm Mike. Uh, most of you know me as the improvement guy. And uh, we'll go to the next slide here, Don. Um, so we're going to uh, dedicate today's session uh, to a couple of folks. Um, it's been a been a challenging week uh, leading up to uh, to this session today. Uh, a couple of weeks for us. Uh, Jack Stout, uh, Todd's dad, has uh, has passed away. Um, and Jack, um, you know, I probably don't need to to introduce him to most of you, but when you uh, <coughs> when you stand back and look at the world we're living in today, um, Jack's ability to design systems that were truly focused on patients that actually involved all of the frontline providers in the design and implementation of the things he created in a way that was fiscally sound and, and sustainable. Um, it, it actually has influenced EMS uh, all over the world. And I, I don't think there's an EMS system I've ever visited out of the hundreds I've visited that don't have some of his influence as part of it. And even though he is, he's not a, not an EMT or a paramedic or a nurse. He's not a clinician of any sort. Um, he's been responsible for saving more lives than, uh, than most uh, anybody else I've met in my career. Um, the, other, the other person in this slide here is uh, Dave Amaya, uh, pictured with his fiance, Angel. <clears throat> Some of you heard me tell the, the story in the first session um, this morning about both Dave and Angel getting uh, COVID and being tested with uh, positive for COVID uh, about three weeks or so ago. Um, and I FedExed him a pulse oximeter. He's a, got a law enforcement background. He was a Los Angeles police officer before, uh, uh, before uh, going into the, the technology world and then joining our team. Um, so he's not a, not a clinician particularly, but I gave him, sent him a pulse oximeter and told him to monitor it. Well, you know, things progressed. To, <clears throat> he was doing fine and then ended up with a fever of 107 and a pulse ox of 72 and uh, went to the hospital and uh, ended up uh, intubated on a ventilator for a week, which is actually a shorter period of time than uh, most folks, um, was able to, uh, to recover remarkably well, get off the ventilator, and actually yesterday morning went home. Um, and so those of you who see those uh, things on Facebook that say, you know, do you know anybody who's actually had COVID or died? <clears throat> well, certainly, certainly we do, and we're, uh, we're really grateful um, that Dave is, uh, has done well and is, uh, is, is back um, among the, the, the living and, and recovering from that, from that perspective. So next slide, Todd. 
And as, uh, as Kevin foreshadowed in the video that you watched uh, in the break in between uh, sessions here, <clears throat> and Anthony mentioned, normally we'd have um, uh, all of you in a classroom. There'd be a whole bunch of our team members there. We'd be grabbing you during breaks and setting up breakfasts and lunches and dinners and late night bar meetings and inviting you to our suite and at our booth, we'd be doing demos and, and all this kind of stuff to interact because this Pinnacle is one of our favorite meetings for really connecting with customers that exist and, and talking to people who might want to uh, sign up and become a part of the First Watch family. <clears throat> and obviously with, uh, with the virtual uh, adventures, the gift that COVID has brought us, it makes it a little more challenging. So what I'd like you to do right now, this is where you interact. Um, and uh, if you uh, uh, bring your um, mouse or uh, clicker over your Zoom, it'll highlight a, a little set of bars there, a bar at the bottom that gives you some controls. Click on the chat and uh, open that up and uh, type, type in a message. Let us know who you are, uh, where you're from, because otherwise we'd never know. Um, part of the reason I want you to do that is so that you'll be, uh, feel free to write questions, comments, quips, quotes at any point in time uh, during this presentation. <clears throat> and if you want to just kind of get started by, um, I, I'm really curious, what are, what are you scared about? What are you most nervous about over the next 12, 24, 36 months of this pandemic as you're, as you're going forward? Because um, chances are there are things that our First Watch team has built that might help ease some of your fears and manage that. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Todd and Deb and I'll be monitoring, uh, monitoring questions as we go. Great, can you hear me okay, Mike? You sound great. That's astonishing, that's excellent. <laughs> I actually got it right finally. Uh, I'm running, uh, uh, you know, running a little bit low on, uh, on, on energy the last couple of weeks, but uh, thank everybody so much. Uh, thank for all of our customers, I know uh, um, the bulk of people at this are typically uh, customers. We've got this nice advantage. They you know, sort of always find the, uh, the silver lining. Uh, normally, the only people who uh, are able to attend this are people who can get the budget and travel to go to Pinnacle. Uh, and uh, so this year, it's different. So we've got a, a, a big variety of customers and non-customers. So first, uh, one of the things that I'll say is I really want to thank our customers uh, for making all this possible. Uh, you're, our, you're, you're our dots on our map. <laughs> and uh, as we go through too, just to give you a quick update, we processed more than 312 million incidents live uh, since 1998. That's about a new record uh, every 0.6 seconds for about 50 million uh, records annually. We, uh, uh, you, you all, our, our customers, are represent about 500 agencies across the U.S. and Canada, uh, which is about 45%. Uh, of the population of the U.S. and Canada. And as those of you who work with us know, uh, we come from a really broad background in public safety experience and, uh, and, and uh, about 350 years, and another 350 separate years of public safety software development experience on our team. So uh, we, we're, we're really honored to serve you. Here's a uh, shot. It's really hard to get everybody together at the same time. Uh, we're all uh, not very good uh, followers. We're uh, a little bit like herding cats. Uh, but this is most of our team. We're about 60 people now and um, um, super lucky. Most everybody is based in Carlsbad, although at the moment it kind of doesn't matter where you're based because we're working out of our houses uh, pretty much all over. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to our uh, product management and engineering teams. Uh, Debbie Gilligan is on with us, our director of product development, uh, and Kevin Lee, our director of engineering, uh, may be listening, so I'm going to be careful what I say. Uh, but uh, the product management team and the engineering team really work together to juggle everything. And this year, particularly the, the, the after January part of the year has been, like you, uh, um, for us, has been extremely um, challenging to be able to juggle uh, COVID and all of the challenges uh, that, uh, that come. So these folks and their, their people have done a, just a fabulous job and I'm uh, really, really proud of, uh, of the work they've done. We're going to work this. It was really hard to put some structure on the, uh, the, the, the what to talk about because there are so many different things that we've touched on. One of the things that happened with COVID was some of our larger long-term projects, we had to just kind of push off to the side, break up into chunks, uh, smaller pieces, because we had to work in between the, uh, the frankly tremendous need 
uh, that, that most of you had in terms of taking a look at monitoring uh, COVID light calls, especially in the beginning, uh, doing a lot of free text monitoring, working a lot to help you uh, track PPE and things like that. And so we did a, a, a zillion little things. Uh, so we're not gonna be able to really show them all here. We're just gonna work our way through uh, the bits and pieces, but they're generally gonna be in COVID-19 things that were required or uh, started for COVID and then really have inspired uh, further work that we're taking further along. Uh, we're gonna talk about things in terms of integrations and partnerships and other areas that didn't fit in those buckets. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Deb um, at the very end before the question and answer is to talk about our IDB interactive data visualization enhancement because um, that's one of the most exciting things we've done. I think we'll have the, one of the larger impacts on, uh, on, on all of you. We did a lot more work on it this year. So if you looked at it, saw us last year, uh, um, I encourage you to, to take a look again. It's, uh, it's been great. So um, you're going to kind of see a wheel develop around COVID-19 here. As we, uh, as we as we've gone, uh, we created over 200 triggers uh, for uh, uh, customer agencies all across the U.S. and Canada, uh, and those were um, using CAD, uh, ProQA, and electronic patient care records. Um, about 71, almost 72 percent of those triggers are customized for your specific needs because everybody is capturing the information uh, differently, and that's one of our lessons learned going forward is we are uh, going to work really hard with uh, a group of customers to create a, a more of a standardized way to address uh, positives and, and pertinent negatives uh, in COVID. We, uh, we noticed this during Ebola uh, and a little bit during H1N1, but mostly during Ebola, where we wanted to address, people want to address whether somebody had traveled or not. And uh, that really contributed a lot to the uh, complexity of those triggers and uh, slowed down the speed at which we could roll them out for everybody because everyone was custom. Now, normally, uh, that is our work is custom and uh, custom work related to using your data. But when everybody needed to start monitoring COVID quickly, uh, it was uh, it was a hindrance. So we're going to come out with some best practices uh, for how to capture uh, the whatever the monkey box or whatever happens next. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and also the pertinent negatives like did not travel, things like that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that was kind of neat was our reports team put together what we call an event listing report. So, you know, if you're looking at your trigger, every trigger has an event listing, <clears throat> and that's, <clears throat> excuse me, very useful from a, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an analysis and also from a, um, let me get a little drink of water here. Sorry, <clears throat> but one of the things that people wanted was they wanted to be able to get an automated report of that. So rather than an alert like we normally do, they wanted a daily report showing the, uh, the, the calls that met, in this case, the COVID uh, criteria. So they created an event listing report, which is super quick and easy to deploy. <clears throat> and generally, basically just takes a particular trigger. This is from our friends in Onslow County in North Carolina. <clears throat> and basically takes the output of the trigger uh, and, and, and generates a report that can be run on demand or can be uh, and can be uh, sent out in a subscription on a time basis like three o'clock in the morning for the previous day or whatever works for you. <clears throat> we did a lot of work with Power BI dashboards. Um, you um, you have a, uh, um, uh, I've seen us talk about Power BI dashboards. We're using it more and more and more to meet um, an increasing number of, of needs, and it's, it's very, very cool. Um, so this is an example from our friends up in Snohomish County, Washington. Snohomish County, you may remember, was the, 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 the agency with the first officially recognized uh, COVID-19 or back then coronavirus um, uh, case uh, in, uh, in the United States. And so this is their Power BI dashboard, and they all look a little different, but capture a lot of different uh, information, very flexible, uh, very interactive. Power BI is, uh, is be something we're doing a lot more with uh, in lots and lots of areas. <clears throat> uh, we added a simple little thing that I think makes a tremendous difference. And while we did it for COVID, you can use it right now for any trigger you have in First Watch. <clears throat> and that is if you go into the analysis tool and you pick a date range, 
This is actually a, a, a combination of uh, all of our COVID-19 uh, triggers. <clears throat> you may know that uh, the event list, graphs, maps, and all that, um, you know, that it loads a lot faster than it used to in the old days, uh, but it still takes a bit. But the time series by day option down here in this uh, circled red area, time series by day option always loads very, very quickly. Uh, so you can look at long periods of time and you can always only see this on this graph. We've added two nice new things for it. One is just gives you a count of calls that meet the trigger criteria, in this case COVID, but it could be your all incidents, your all responses, uh, opioid overdoses, anything you have a trigger for, it'll show you the count for that whole period. And sometimes that's all you need is really how many overdoses did we have in May, uh, things like that. Uh, but another thing, because I'm a nerd, is super exciting to me, is that if you click this Excel download link, um, then you get an Excel spreadsheet that's got two tabs on it, a daily tab and an hourly tab. And what that means is for whatever your time period is, this time period I did was from March 1st uh, till yesterday, um, it gives you one value per day. So on March 1st of 2020, there were 2,783 uh, COVID calls in this trigger um, and so forth. The hourly chart actually breaks that up by hour. So uh, this was for the whole day and on the right is one value per hour. Um, so for the midnight hour, there are 114. For the one o'clock hour, there were 99. Two o'clock hour, 79 and so forth. This is really nice for building your own charts, doing pivot tables, uh, looking at uh, um, you know really activity over time. And right now, when you want to look at things like, are we having more cardiac arrests or not? Are we having more strokes or not? You can go into your cardiac arrest or stroke or other trigger, go to that time series by day chart and download this and do a lot of neat nerdy stuff. Um, we also did a lot of work with our health intelligence page. Uh, we have, um, you know, Debbie uh, Gilligan, our uh, uh, Sylvia Verdugo, our medical director, Pam Farber, our infection control advisor, uh, and Jenny Ever come to work a lot on our health intelligence page, and uh, we've kept it up quite a bit. So there's COVID-19 section, overdoses, opioids, seasonal influenza, which is coming up more, uh, other areas like in the news, keeping your workforce safe. I really encourage you, it's free, whether you're a customer or not, go to firstwatch.net forward slash HI, check it out. You can sign up for updates, and anytime there's an update to the page, you'll get a notification. Uh, and be able to keep track of stuff. Uh, Pam and Sylvia, Jenny and Deb do a fabulous job of keeping this up and making it really relevant to um, public safety and, and, and EMS specifically. We also were quite busy helping uh, Paramedic Chiefs of Canada and the International Academy of Emergency Dispatch with their webinars. This is just a, a graphic through last month uh, showing the kind of time frames uh, for COVID starting with the Wuhan pneumonia cluster on December 31st. Uh, the first U.S. patient, the first Canadian patient, uh, and less than two weeks later, we had our first Paramedic Chiefs of Canada webinar talking about COVID. Uh, we just completed uh, um, uh, last week our 14th webinar we've gone monthly, but those are all recorded online, and there's a ton of great information. The, the most recent one, last week, uh, Pam did a fabulous update on what's changed in the last month with COVID and really boils it down in a very practical way. I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, trigger grouping viewer, uh, this is, the thing that is one of the things that I'm not going to show, but essentially uh, what we're working on is being able to take triggers from either an individual customer or across customers and group them either by words that are in the name or ultimately creating a set of tags like if you were uh, doing keywords on a trigger as they get built. So for example, as you can imagine, a lot of our customer agencies have uh, a cardiac arrest trigger or a respiratory arrest trigger or a stroke trigger. This is the beginning of giving us an ability to uh, combine like triggers very easily into uh, uh, counts and, and buckets to be able to look at month over month trends, year over year trends, uh, things like that. So as we know more and have more about that, we will uh, walk you through it and, and, uh, and re eventually roll that out for customers to use within their own trigger base. Um, we did a lot of work with Academy Analytics, um, and their, and, and which is our partnership with Party Dispatch and the um, International Academy of Emergency Dispatch. 
we created a, an, an emerging infectious disease page within Academy Analytics. So people that have ProQA can add on Academy Analytics by, by contacting uh, Cardi Dispatch, the, re the regular rep of Cardi Dispatch, um, and they can get it. And there's a ton of information in there. We'll see a little bit more about it as we go. But uh, in this case, we're looking at the EIDS and the affirmative calls, the negative answers, and then ones where they were in the form less than 15 seconds, uh, which probably means they just kind of look through it quickly and you can use that to uh, track what's being asked. Uh, we also added a priority, I'm sorry, a protocol 36 uh, uh, page that looks at the questions and issues related to protocol 36 and really gives you inf information at your fingertips. It's sort of ProQA reports on the web, accessible on your phone, uh, up through near, very near real time, rather than something you have to go in and run. Uh, demand analysis uh, is another area that, that we worked on. A lot of people are trying to understand what's happening with their overall demand or demand in particular areas. Uh, and so one of the things we've done with demand analysis is, uh, and we're just getting ready to roll it out in beta, uh, is to allow you to output the demand analysis data and then pick which weeks to use or not use. So if you had uh, you know, some weeks that were particularly high or particularly low, uh, you can actually choose to exclude those and, and ignore them for purposes of demand analysis and not have your information be skewed by a temporary uh, change. That will also work really well for any other thing that would affect your volume, whether that be a storm, uh, whether that be a, a, big, a big conference or convention in town, protests, anything like that. It's a really cool implementation. Um, resilient first 90 day, I'm gonna hand that over to Mike real quick. Yeah, and our, uh, our resilient stuff, as I was looking through the fears on the, on the list there, a whole bunch of them are related to burnout, stress, complacency issues, those kinds of things within the uh, workforce. And, uh, and Resilient First, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a system uh, to assess uh, the emotional, psychological, physical uh, strength and capability of your teammates for being able to get through stressful situations. And then it basically turns your smartphone into a one-on-one -on -one, uh, resilience coach and educator to help them develop um, uh, the, those, those strengths and abilities to deal with stressful situations. <clears throat> so we've got um, uh, a 90 day option. Usually we right. ask people to sign up for a year, but with COVID we, uh, we offer a shorter version for, uh, for a, a smaller amount of money. And the other, the other thing that's uh, is, is just been added, uh, we're, we're constantly adding with our, uh, with our partner in Australia, uh, new modules. And uh, the latest module is a financial health module, which is one that I wish I would have had when I was 20 years old. I would not be in the financial situation I am today if I would have <coughs> had the education. But with all of the economic insecurity that your folks are feeling uh, during the course of this pandemic, um, getting them some specific education and strategies to better manage their finances in a sustainable way um, would be hugely helpful. Todd? Great, thank you. Uh, Mike, I'm, I'm sorry you didn't have it in your 20s, but I'm glad you did because otherwise you might have retired by now and we wouldn't get to work with you. So uh, there's always a silver lining again. Uh, I, I, um, have, I, have a, I have a nine year old and I've been a crappy saver. Um, so I'm gonna be working well into my 90s, I suspect. And for you, that is your time, Todd. That's, that's awesome. Well, I'm sorry about that, but I'm so happy. Um, we also are working on a thing that we don't really have a name for. The best term I can come up with, and we haven't thought a lot about it yet, is a thing called a resource tracker. Um, it's, uh, we built it for our friends in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and it's really a, a simple way to be able to, in their case, they're using it to track COVID bed availability if there are three hospitals. And each hospital can go in and update the status of, in their case, that emergency department inpatient and ICU bed availability for COVID patients and it's seen in the dispatch center and it's a sort of a live relatively simple way uh, to uh, to be able to track really almost anything that you're willing to go in and manually update and be able to uh, um, have everybody see it and it updates instantly in real time. It's a real sort of serverless type technology which is a term you'll start hearing more of if you haven't already. Um, uh, earlier in the very first session, Ray Barashansky um, from Pennsylvania mentioned that there is money uh, 
uh, flowing in public health more than they've had for, for years. And he suggested that uh, EMS agencies should uh, partner in any way they can with, the, with their local public health agencies. Uh, this last one uh, that I'm, or this, this current one I'm talking about is Essence. Essence is a syndromic surveillance tool that was created by Johns Hopkins uh, and is used all over as a standalone tool. And they also have a version of it that's online, sort of a cloud version that the CDC has. Um, and we have links with Essence in, um, in one county, um, very forward thinking county, uh, Riverside County in California. They uh, um, are bringing the Essence data from hospitals and, and clinics, things like that into First Watch so they can see everything in the way that they're comfortable with within First Watch and make it super easy to compare the data. Uh, and um, uh, Matt Zabatsky was on that same um, session early this morning. And um, one of the things, and Matt is in Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth is within Tarrant County. And we're working with Tarrant County Public Health to actually help push MedStars data uh, in, in real time over to uh, the Tarrant County Public Health Agency to go into their essence system for their own analysis. So in both of those cases, uh, COVID and public health funding is, is funding that. And really this is a great way to open up a, um, a discussion for doing even more with your system. So for you first watch agencies, uh, it's, it's, it's relatively straightforward if, you're, if the, your public health agency use Essence and most of them do. Um, as you can imagine, the flu um, um, season is coming upon us. Um, there's really, uh, our friend Pam uh, says is really, uh, you know, the only thing that distinguishes flu symptoms from COVID symptoms right now uh, that we're going to see is that, is that loss or uh, exaggeration of the uh, sense of uh, a smell or taste. Uh, and so what happens with the flu network will be very, very important this year because it will be really hard to distinguish between them. And so we're kind of going all in on making sure that our flu network is as dialed in as possible. And I think it's going to be critical for us uh, to do that. So we're spending, let's have spent a lot of time, we'll be spending a lot more uh, cleaning up. If you don't know about the flu network, uh, check it out. Uh, talk with somebody in support. Um, if you participate in the flu network, there is no charge, uh, but your data will have to be able to be shared in aggregate in a very HIPAA-friendly way uh, with other providers, and so everybody can know what's happening around them. And then uh, one of the COVID-related things is we can't go to conferences like this. We normally have our own Collaborate Live sessions um, uh, conferences at, 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 uh, in Carlsbad, which we started last year and has been a huge success just in time to not be able to have it again. Um, and lots of other conferences, lots of ability to go on site with customers, for customers to come visit us uh, individually. So we're really sort of pivoting like, uh, like everybody else has been with the idea that we need to get that information that normally would come from a lot of in-person visits out. And so we started Fridays with First Watch. Uh, we've had uh, two sets of Fridays, uh, Fridays uh, the first pass and uh, Resilient First Fridays. Those are the first and third Fridays of the month. We're getting ready to ramp up for the second and fourth Friday uh, for different aspects of the system. So the idea is it would be at least something every month that would be beneficial to you that we can teach, train, engage, get people to share ideas and best practices. So uh, keep your eye out for that information because we'll be doing more and more of that. Recording all of those, of course, uh, so that you can have more webinars to watch. Um, didn't have any more room on my COVID slide, so I had to put this in. This is sort of extra COVID-19 help. Um, I, Mike wouldn't say this, um, but, but I really will. Mike and Sasha have written a, a, a fabulous book, uh, Supercharge Your Stress Management in the Age of COVID-19. Um, Mike's been working on uh, wellness for decades. Again, I won't say how long for you, Mike. Um, kind of but you. Uh, but well, what did you say? I said that was kind of you. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, but I really encourage you. It's uh, it's 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 very practical. It's very evidence based. Um, it's it's everything Mike always does for all of us, which is to take stuff that's very complicated and makes it um, uh, very uh, digestible and, and practical and something you can take home and work on right away. So I'd really encourage you to check out combatcovidstress.com. Um, it's, not, it's not a first watch thing, I just believe in it 
highly. It really will boil down a whole ton of the information out there into one spot geared towards emergency services and healthcare professionals. The next bucket we're gonna get into is integrations and partnerships. So it's kind of, some of these are actual partnerships, some of them are integrations with things. Um, we're doing some work with American Heart Association and they get with the guidelines of stroke and STEMI registries, they're two different registries. Uh, and what that's doing is it's allowing the hospital, they call them abstractors, that currently hand enter for the most part that information from the EMS record into the registry for STEMI and stroke patients and it will allow them to essentially, with your permission, log into your first watch system, pull across the data. Now these are for patients that they have seen. So there's the HIPAA issues all taken care of there and you'll, you'll have to authorize them in the first place. Uh, they can then move that data into the registry, the de-identified data into the registry, uh, like they would hand type in any way, but saving the hand typing and the errors. And um, also same thing for, uh, for both for STEMIs and strokes. And then the second phase of that project is to, we'll get the get with the guidelines hospital outcome information for strokes and STEMIs back into First Watch to be able to be run through first pass and things like that. So if I missed a STEMI, I missed a stroke, uh, overcalled or undercalled, you can look at those things and get that outcome automatically into First Watch. Uh, and it should be a, a, a super exciting thing. We're using it the, um, to the registry now in a couple of places and uh, the abstractors in the hospitals are, are absolutely loving it. Again, we'll get the patient outcome data coming back through and that will just become a normal part of first watch. You can have triggers and alerts. Uh, if you took a patient in that didn't, you, you thought was an abdominal pain, it turned out to be a, uh, a STEMI. Um, you might want to know about that right away with an alert. You might want to rerun it through first pass, things like that. I mentioned the, the Fridays with, uh, with First Watch. We partner with Prodigy EMS. Prodigy EMS uh, is, a, is a learning management system that uh, was created by our friends at Pro EMS out in the Boston area. Um, it's a really neat system if you haven't used it. Um, they really thought through it very, very well. And so we partner with them uh, as the, 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 the way that we're rolling out our Fridays with, with First Watch and getting it all online and available. And we're, we're super excited to work with them about it this Friday, first Friday with First Watch's first pass team, say that 10 times really fast, um, is, uh, has been a, a real success. We'll start to uh, engage it in the other areas. The other thing that we're doing, which I don't, don't have a slide for, but uh, is that we're also integrating with First Pass. And so I could be doing a first pass review. And in that first pass review, I could determine that, you know, yep, paramedic stout in fact, does need to work on his uh, um, pain management skills. The rest of the system is doing fine. This is something that we need to, to get out some more, uh, some more education. And you'll be able to actually assign uh, courses within Prodigy directly from within First Pass. And we'll actually, the first, then Prodigy will send the notification out. And then when they, the Stout has taken the class, passed the test, whatever else, that information will come back into First Watch and First Pass. Uh, to really close that loop and you can see which classes are successful, which classes are more effective and so forth. We've integrated in a, a couple of different places with it with another company called Live Stories. It's really at customer's request. We're outputting data uh, to a location. I think it's actually on, the, on, on in, in Google and Live Stories picks that data up live and in real time and they create uh, web pages that are essentially tell stories about data uh, a number of cities and counties use live stories. And so, uh, of course, it's your data, so we're happy to, to help make that happen. But there's some really neat, neat systems that are, uh, that are using that right now. I mentioned Power BI before, so I won't, I won't beat you up for that, that again. Um, but I do especially want to talk about Academy Analytics and Walk Me. I mentioned Academy Analytics before with the Emerging Infectious Diseases and Protocol 36. Um, in this case, we're using a third-party tool called WalkMe, and you'll notice in Academy Analytics as we get as, as we get ready to roll this out, there's already one. There's a little megaphone up here on the sort of the, the, the rightmost arrow, and that's our own tool, sort of new cool thing. So when you log into Academy Analytics, you'll see what's new. We'll be moving that megaphone out beyond Academy Analytics into the rest of the First Watch uh, environment and system. But you see these uh, um, little question marks in circles. Uh, that's this tool called WalkMe. And so um, when you first go into WalkMe, into Academy Analytics, once WalkMe has been enabled for you, you will see 
basically a um, um, part of the screen will be dimmed and there will be an option. I think it's going to actually take you through the dashboard first, which basically then means that you can interact with the system and learn as you go. Uh, first watch itself can be pretty complicated. Sometimes people are intimidated. We're always happy to help, but sometimes people want to learn on their own. And so this way you can kind of go through it again and again. And you, it explains how and, and what you can do with different things. And whatever part of it is, um, is not dimmed, you can actually interact with it. And it'll teach you how to use the system. And we uh, are starting it with Academy Analytics because it's a very discreet uh, group of, uh, of features and tools. But we'll be rolling out WalkMe to uh, the rest of the first flight system as well. We think this will really make it easy for your people that come on board to uh, feel more comfortable just exploring uh, within uh, first watch and, and, and the first watch world. <clears throat> We're, um, I'm super excited about the next thing too. We're working with uh, our friends at EMS survey team. Many of you have EMS survey team uh, and, and um, uh, my buddy Abdo Mode at Northwell has been pushing for the idea uh, of being able to get surveys results, simple survey results, very quickly and, and you know what he brought up with me was when you know he bought his mom a, an appliance as the as the appliance repair or install person was driving away he got a text asking about their service and while you wouldn't want to do that on on all kinds of calls there are certainly many kinds of calls that we uh, respond on EMS people respond on that you might like that feedback right away so they were already a first watch customer. They were already an EMS survey team customer. So we partnered up with Bobby Hopewell and his team in the EMS survey team. They've done a great work. And basically the, the filtering of calls and what should be sent out, you know, what, who should get a text or an email uh, is handled on the first watch side. And we send it over to EMS survey team and they send that notification out right away or for whatever delay there is. And this is an example of a Northwell with their sends you a mobile touch data. And uh, I've, I've, I've taken one of their triggers and kind of merged it together so you can see. So, you know, here's a, a, a set of, of data from uh, this week. And, um, and as you look at it, you can see that the you know, time sent to queue was 4.10 uh, p.m. 4.10, then when they route at 4.11 uh, on the 20th and on the 21st at three o'clock. So just a little less than uh, 24 hours they got survey results back that they felt was exceptional care, very likely to recommend, did you feel listened to, did you feel cared for, uh, free text, what could we have done better and would you like to be called. Uh, notice that <clears throat> here on this one on the 21st, uh, a patient was, the call started at 8.24 p.m. by 10.22 p.m. on the same day, less than two hours from when they first called for the, for the ambulance, they had completed the survey and they actually wanted someone to call them. And under most circumstances, they would have had to call and complain. They might have had something like that come out, you know, come back to them a month or so later. But this is a really powerful tool <clears throat> that allows them to, to do it. And just looking at this month, they've had an almost 14% return rate um, of uh, meaning for every one sent out, they've got 14% back. 50% of those were returned within less than four hours, and 92% were returned in less than two days. So you can actually get feedback about a call, ask the crew what happened, give, reach back out to that customer and, uh, and, and, and address the issue, that patient, that family member, and address the issue very quickly. I know when I was a medic, if you had come talk to me about a call within that shift or the next shift, I had a pretty, I had a pretty good chance of remembering what happened and being able to explain and, and, and give my perspective. But if you come talk to me about a call two weeks later, three weeks later, Good luck. And that was when my brain worked really well when I was in my 20s, um, less yet now when I can't remember what happened yesterday. So super excited about this, uh, this uh, collaboration with the MS survey team in Northwell. Um, Mike already mentioned the Resilient First Finance module or financial module. We're also partnering, at, I'm not sure if, if you've heard of RQI uh, partners. They're a, a, a partnership between um, American Heart Association and Lairdall. And they have a specific section of it, RQI telecommunicator focused on getting CPR started on the phone as rapidly as possible. Um, and we partnered with them. They saw what we did with Academy Analytics and we were building with them their analytics 
uh, platform for their RQI telecommunicator uh, program. And we're super excited about that. We'll be hosting a webinar. We did one already with uh, Fridays with First Pass. We'll do another general one so everybody's aware of it. Uh, and it works really well with Priority Dispatch and, uh, and it should be good. And I'm super excited too because the um, being able to have the data flow eventually, one of the long-term plans is to be able to have the data that you want to go into RQIT for review and analysis can happen automatically from, from first watch uh, as you go through that and save, uh, make it even easier for, uh, for improving your speed of getting CPR. Um, a, a lot of you hopefully know about NEMSQA. Uh, NEMSQA is a National EMS Quality Alliance and uh, we just, um, within the last few days, uh, have agreed to uh, be a partner and support NEMSQA uh, because we think it's so important. Um, Debbie Gilligan um, and, uh, and our former medical director, Dr. Garza, were both on the COMPASS committee, uh, or COMPASS committees that uh, really created the, the core of NEMSQA. And NEMSQA's mission really now is to put those measures and make them um, real and practical and a thing that can improve. And so NEMSQA reached out to us and, and, uh, and asked us to, to partner with them and we were, we're, we're honored to do that. So keep your eyes peeled for more information about that. I think that's gonna uh, really make a nice uh, difference in the people that are uh, leading the NEMSQA side are, are some of the best people I know. Um, so that's really all about the integrations and partnerships. So you can see there's a lot that's been, that's gone on there. And then we have stuff that just doesn't fit into either of those buckets. Um, so first pass, first pass patient centric view. Uh, we showed this last year, we've done a lot more work on it, operationalized it. We're now rolling it out in a number of places, but essentially it can take two different sources of, of electronic patient care record data, even from different systems. This is a view of uh, AMR meds data along with ESO data combined to put this sort of what did the patient receive and it's less just about what did a particular medic do then turns it around and says from the patient's perspective what did they get the care they needed regardless of who gave it. Uh, the patient really doesn't care whether the fire department or the uh, transport service gave them aspirin as long as somebody does and does it soon. Uh, and so that's what this is about and, and it's, a, it's a big culture shift for a lot of agencies because it, it, so many things are focused on individual medics. And this really puts the whole idea of, uh, uh, you know, do the patient get what they need when they need it uh, front and center? And, and I think it's gonna be a paradigm shift for a lot of places. Um, one of the other cool things that is, was, seems simple, but is a lot more work is that uh, our control charts now auto shift. We worked with the folks at QI Macros um, uh, that are, some of our favorite and definitely some of Mike's favorite uh, approach for uh, control charts. And so we've built a set of rules and so that the control charts will automatically shift uh, so you can identify uh, genuine trends, not things that feel like trends uh, and, uh, and genuine outliers as you go through that. So uh, you'll see that in the first pass control charts and then we're in the process of building and control charts and really as a widget for all kinds of other things, including uh, triggers and so forth. Uh, first pass reports. Um, we made the comment the other day that first pass itself is on version three. Uh, we started it in 2010, rolled it out in 2014. We've had three major revisions, but we really haven't given the reports log. We've, we added the, the, the dashboard and the control charts and that's been, that's been fabulous, but we really need to spend some time on the reports. And so we're going through the process of enhancing and streamlining and, and getting rid of some redundancies. And you'll see and hear about that as we go forward. And also give us an opportunity then to focus on other things that you would want to see. Um, most of you who work with us know that we have our Collaborate online platform, sort of the online community that we rolled out last year. Uh, and it's not been adopted as we had hoped to be able to allow people to uh, share ideas with each other directly. Uh, we love hearing them. We love being the hub and the conduit uh, for those things. It's a big part of why we exist. But at the same time, we want to make sure that people that are doing the same kind of work and, and have the same first watch tools can all share. So we're working to, to refine, collaborate, figure out what about it 
we can use to, to make it uh, more helpful for you and uh, really get it tuned in and dialed up or maybe switch to some other approach for that. We've been doing a lot. The reports people have been super busy with lots and lots of live workload reports. I'm not going to go into a detail because we've shown it before, but it's been uh, the workload reports themselves are complicated enough because of how the underlying data works. This is an example from our friends at MSA in Oklahoma that is busy always looking for, uh, um, you know, what, how many units are available, how many are on calls, you know, who's at end of shift, who's on bed delay, and they literally use this to move people around and assign calls that are not um, uh, critical urgent calls, uh, including both the uh, uh, activity related to calls and activity related to post moves, move ups, out of service, uh, things like that. Um, some people have our online compliance utility, so they're, how they're monitoring their response times uh, and penalties and fines if they have that. We've, uh, up, we've uh, updated the online compliance utility to version three, and it, it has some features that will probably roll over into first pass soon related to how comments can show up. You can have threaded comments easier and also be able to tell at a glance, uh, you know, whether there's been feedback on a particular record or not. Um, on the GIS side, we've done a lot of work. Esri has been coming out with some versions and, and their updates take a lot of work. If you've got uh, GIS folks in your world, you know how, how that can kind of change all of your work. And so we've been working to uh, um, implement the Esri updates. Uh, I've done a lot of work on uh, GIS performance. Um, um, Chris uh, Carlson, our product manager, and Zion and Troy uh, uh, and the engineering team are joined at the hip. Uh, working through that. And one of the uh, GIS features that people have wanted for a while that we're, we'll be rolling out is this clustering. So you notice if you look at your first watch maps on a normal basis, you would have a, uh, an icon, often a triangle or a little circle or maybe a custom, uh, custom icon, depending on your mapping. But the problem is if, if, if uh, calls uh, occur near each other or even at the same location, that can be hard to tell how, how active it is. And so what clustering does is it'll actually show larger circles when there are more calls at that location or within a, a very defined area and fewer. So this is a quick way to be able to see activity that otherwise might be harder to detect um, with just a, a bunch of uh, icons stacked on top of each other. Do you have anything that you would add there to that that I missed? Um, no, Todd, just other than it's, you know, it's still new. So some of the, the concepts and ideas of what we can do with clustering is probably going to grow beyond what you're showing. Um, but we, we can discuss that on one of our first watch Fridays. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, and then in the background, we've done a whole ton of work. We continue to do a whole ton of work on infrastructure, redundancy, uh, security. As most of you know, especially during COVID, uh, a lot of bad folks have been uh, very seriously attacking healthcare, public safety, government in general, and uh, suppliers and, and, uh, and, and partners like us. So we have also stepped up our internal and external uh, security work to make sure that we are as, pos as secure as we can, can possibly be. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Deb, and I don't know how to do that. Uh, hopefully uh, Matt's on with us or Deb can just grab it and she'll talk about IDV. I think I, think I can grab it. So stand by just one. So Todd, you should be able to see my screen. Okay. Yes, trigger, trigger view. Yeah. Yep. yep. I'm going to pop over here. Uh, stand by. There we go. Um, so first of all, you can hear me okay and you can see my screen, correct? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, um, so good morning, everyone, or afternoon. Um, this is the first pinnacle I've been able to be in um, flip-flops and bare feet. So I'm super excited and it's not humid in my office. So that's exciting. Um, so as Todd was going through, we've done a ton of stuff this year. So, you know, as he mentioned, thanks to the engineering team, um, special thanks to um, my product group um, because they're, they're managing your requests and trying to get them out as quick as possible. Um, we will discuss more of the modifications as we get into those First Watch Fridays. So today I just wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time um, to talk about what IDV is. So IDV is Interactive Data Visualization, 
right? Um, and the whole concept is really to kind of let you work with your data. Um, I am going to give a special thanks and a shout out to our folks at Prince George's County, Montgomery County, North Shore Fire Rescue, Snohomish, Cypress Creek, North Collier. Um, you guys have kept me really busy um, for the last couple months. So um, I, I hope this benefits um, our entire IDB community. Um, so a little bit about what IDV does. Um, so the power of IDV, um, this is going to be on the other slide, is really from a trigger. Um, if you start from scratch, what you've already probably have realized is your data is dirty. Um, so you've got that advantage of using a first watch trigger and being able to work with that data in the way that you've actually kind of built it and maintained it. So what we're thinking is, you know, if I'm looking at something, I want to be able to know where were my concerns? What do I need to worry about? How often is this happening? Why is it happening? You know, when did it happen or to who is it happening, right? It really should be about you being able to ask questions of the data and being able to find that out. Or you get that phone call from city council or from the mayor's office that says, hey, you know, I, I had this weird question. Can you figure this out? It should be able to answer those questions for you easily. So um, that's a pretty dynamic request. Um, so when I mentioned the power of IDB is in the trigger, I'm going to pop over here and show you, I think, there we go. Um, I, I, Nikki, I see that you're online too, so I hope you don't mind that I'm sharing your trigger, but um, special thanks to Janet Baker, um, Darlene, also from our customer care group who build out a lot of these triggers. One of the things to think about with IDB, it's really kind of a super trigger, so I'm just going to kind of scroll through and you can see things like category, call type, discipline, nature, um, city, state, or zip. Um, I can look at things by hour of the day, by day of week, by specific grids. So when, when you're thinking about IDB and we're talking about what is it that you want to accomplish, part of what we need to do is make sure that that information is in your trigger. Um, I think we talked about it last year. Everybody gets one IDB um, and most of you start with an all responses IDB. Could be linked to an additional data source, could be linked to multiple data sources. So really our first conversation is what do you think you want to do? Because then let's brainstorm about how we get you there. Um, so when we talk a little bit about the IDB setup enhancements, um, we started with six. Um, you now have nine that are available to configure for every single IDB. Um, so if you have one and you've purchased one, or if you have one and in the future you're gonna be able to do other things, you'll be able to do nine per each IDB. Um, the, we enhanced the color picker. It used to be that you had to remember what that color code was. Um, and uh, that's kind of, kind of hard to remember. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of these. So the grid only option, um, a new operator types and the ability to group by. So if I jump over to IDB and we go to IDB setup. So Mike and Todd, can I get a thumbs up? My screen shifted and you see, perfect, thank you. Um, so there are some folks who've said, I don't want people to see widgets. I don't want them to see everything, but I want them to be able to ask questions of the data. Um, could I just have a grid only view? When, so when I check this box in my IDB setup, it disables all of my widgets. It makes available any of the data elements that you've chosen to enable. Um, so those are available in the grid as well as I have the abilities to filter. So that's available now. You guys can play around with that. Um, the color picker, just so you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, so not only is it important to have functional data, it's important to have it kind of look pretty, I think. Um, and Todd and I go round and round about this, but some of you have asked for that. So this just gives you the option if I was going to change something or if I want to save custom colors, um, I can go ahead and make, make those changes and it's just a simple little thing, um, but it made a lot of people happy. Um, operator types and group by. So you'll notice already this widget here that we're looking at. So I, I had it configured for weekend incidents by priority. This says this is Cypress Creek. This is my version of their trigger. So this is really kind of not what they have they're looking at. Um, so there's a couple things here to take a look at is for a column chart or a line chart, <clears throat> you now have a new option. So once you've chosen your data element, you can now group data. So in that particular case, I was looking for um, description and on their system is priority. So I'm looking for priority types of calls broken out for days of week. 
Um, and in the case of what days of week, we have a common delimited list of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I'm just looking at my weekend calls. Um, and then the ad other additions is you have a more uh, comprehensive full suite of operators to choose from. And this we know is going to grow where you can do wildcards, where you can do a list in a contain. Um, so there are some limitations here. Um, these are also ands, they're not ors. So some of that work um, is still coming and probably in a, I'd say the next couple months, you'll be able to see those. So more widgets, enhanced color picker, grid only, operator type, and ability to group by. So those are the IDB setup changes. And I'm gonna go through here. So here's an example of nine widgets. This happens to be Prince George's County who, who allowed me to share this, um, where they're looking at data over time. Um, this was something that they started with when the EOC was activated for COVID so they could get breakdown of where are my fire incidents, my ALS incidents, are my ALS calls for services dropping? Um, it was just a high level visual for them um, and one view to look at that. Um, so we've already covered that. So when I look at IDV modifications now, so um, I'll jump over to the live site, but there's quite a few things here that have been modified. So um, let's go to, this is Prince George's. Um, we're gonna go to Cypress Creek. Um, so several of you asked for, if I make a change, right, so I'm looking at last month, but maybe you want to look at today or yesterday or the last seven days, that every time you come into IDV, you have to reset it. So whatever you've set it for, we save those changes now. Um, also in the calendar control, you have start and stop times. So if you're looking for something by shift and you want it to start for today at 6 a.m. and tonight at 6 p.m., you now have that flexibility to do that. And you also have the ability to group by, let me move all of my people over here, um, group by hour, right? So you currently could look at data for a year perspective, a month perspective, a day, but now you also have the ability to look by hour. Because if I'm looking at a 12 hour view, obviously you don't wanna see just those 12 hours, you wanna see it broken down over time. <clears throat> um, so those are those three there. Um, we also added a couple things in your ellipsis menu. So this is the three dots that you have here. When I click on that, um, I had the ability to export to PDF or as a PNG. I now have the ability to export either this widget or down below here, I could export the entire page in a PowerPoint view. So if you're going into a report, you want a nice look and feel, you can copy the widget or the entire page into a PowerPoint export. You also have a new um, option down here, which is show totals. So if I click on the totals and I close this window, you'll see that I start to get a count here. We did this by widget. So I know it kind of seems like I'm maybe taking up more of your time to do that. But the reason is, is there are certain widgets that are going to be super busy that you won't want to have your counts on. Um, and so it wouldn't look good from a display perspective. So we turned that off. From any widget, right? So whether it's a tile or if it's a line in a graph. So here, I, this is for um, my station 51. There were 852 calls. If I right click, I have the option to go directly to the grid or to export that data out to Excel. So you have people who are doing slicers and um, um, pivot tables, right? So they wanna slice and dice their data, or I just wanna see this information populated to the grid because I'm gonna either print it out or I wanna manipulate it a little bit further. So every widget has that option. There is a limitation. Um, the grid has a 9,000 record um, limitation on exporting out to the grid. We're playing around with some other controls um, for that, but right now, if whatever you're trying to export and you right clicked has more than 9,000 records, your only option is going to be exporting to Excel. Um, and let's see, what else do I wouldn't need to tell you? Okay, so um, when we were in the setup, you saw how we can work with the group by widget. So in this case, this is looking at incidents by um, priority for specific days of the week. The one down below here is looking at ALS incidents by station. Um, and then all of these that have those group by options, anything within IDV, right? Gives you the ability to enable or disable. So if I yeah. only look at my, yes, sir. You know, one question from Bob Horton for fire agencies, are you able to group by shift or platoon? 
Yes, you are. So that goes into, great question, and thank you for that. So that goes into your trigger, right? So as you're thinking through, um, most of you have a shift pattern. It's not information that we either get from your CAD or your EPCR, but if you can give us the pattern, then our customer care team can work with our engineering folks and we build that powder in. So then I could have my, my battalion, or I'm sorry, my shift in there. Um, you'd have to tell us how we cal calculate platoon. Um, we did a lot of stuff for our friends at Cypress Creek where they were looking for um, categories. So it could have just been, you know, a certain call type. How do I group them together? Um, and that will actually make IDV super powerful. It takes a little bit more time on our side, um, but we're happy to do that for you so that you get the output that you're asking for. Great question. Hopefully that answered your question. So um, we'll spend a little bit more time about this as we as we go um, on our um, First Watch Fridays. Um, I did want to tell you, so what's in development right now? Um, Cypress Creek is driving a couple things. Cypress Creek and um, Prince George is actually we're asking for kind of similar things, but a little different um, scenario. Um, Cypress Creek dispatches for um, I think it's 19, um, 10 of which they have to supply reports for. So um, we are working on the ability for you to create a new tab within IDV or rename an existing tab or change the order because I want this to be an alphabetical order or whatever order you have. Um, so that is under development right now. So that is going to use the same trigger, but give me the ability to, if I'm building something just for Cypress Creek or just for Spring Fire, I can then work with my engineers. Soon it will be you. But right now, um, if you say, I want Todd to have Spring Fire Department and I want Mike to have Stafford and Jenny can have everything, then we have that flexibility. So we'll do a little bit of that work for you initially, but our goal is that you'll be able to create your own tabs. You'll be able to set your sharing rules or clone them over to the users that you have. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we can talk about when we get into our um, Fridays with First Watch. So I think that's it, Todd, any, any questions or anything I didn't cover that you and Mike think we missed? Um, the only thing that, <clears throat> that I would say is that I think that IDV, um, like you said, if, if you build a trigger that is, um, feature rich, column rich, and, and that and that makes sense to people, then I think we're we're really at a spot that um, you can use it in so many different ways. Everybody can kind of have their own um, their own version of IDV that works really well for for them. Um, and my IDV based on the same trigger as yours can look completely different. Um, and can be filtered by completely different things. And so I think it, it will also uh, mean people don't have to have as many triggers uh, because they can take a trigger and filter it down in the 17 ways they want to take that trigger rather than have 17 triggers. And I'm, I'm super excited about that. It really fits into kind of our whole bucket of stuff that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, um, allows you to interact with your data, to use it more. Some people will want to work at an IDV. Some people will want to get it out to Excel. Some people want it to go to Tableau or Power BI. And we're just trying to enable that because the power, a lot of the power, as Deb said, comes from triggers. And if the trigger calculates filters and does everything uh, accurately, then anybody you give access to the trigger or to an IDV based on that trigger will be using good accurate data. And you don't have to have those embarrassing conversations from when you're out of town and somebody tries to help a city council person and happens to give them you know, wrong data without realizing it, which can eat up more of your time than, than almost anything else in, in, in my experience. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So do we want to, um, do we have any questions, Mike, Could for you, IDV or should I take it back? Um, not specifically for IDV. I've got a, a batch of questions to ask you all whenever you're ready. Okay, um, maybe um, we'll see if we can ans answer them without showing anything and, and uh, that way we'll stay on IDV. And then if we need to give me, you know, that if I need to take control back, I will. Sounds, sounds good. So one of the, you ready for questions? Yeah, I am. Perfect. So uh, one of the first ones that was early was uh, uh, somebody had heard that Michigan does not have the infrastructure 
to support First Watch, which was a, I didn't understand what that question was necessarily. So do you want to respond to that? Um, I don't understand either. We have a, a number of customers in Michigan and um, happy to help more. Um, it's possible that an individual agency, um, you know, might not have a CAD or might not have, um, you know, electronic patient care record, but we integrate with hundreds of different um, um, dispatch, call taking and electronic patient care, fire, RMS and other uh, kinds of systems, some of which are custom, uh, some of which are just sort of the standard, uh, you know, typical vendors we work well with, which, which are like Switzerland, we, we play nice with everything. So I bet you we can help you um, and um, we'll be happy to, uh, happy to do that. Sounds good. So the next one, um, when you were uh, talking kind of about the, uh, uh, the different uh, things that we integrate with, the um, question was uh, add CARES reporting. Uh, to the integration list? It's a great question. Um, I would love to have you reach out. If you would like us to integrate with CARES, I would like you to please send me an email. There will be um, uh, our, our thing. Actually, let me just go, let me take it back and, and I will um, put our, our emails up as we go through this because I've talked a little bit with uh, with the folks at CARES and I think they have a, a, a lot going on. Can you see my, my question screen? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Um, and they have, I think they have a lot going on and there are a number of ways I think we could help with CARES um, uh, and, and we would love to, but, um, and they are open to the idea. It's just not a, a priority for them. So if we had a, a, a bunch of customers who wish that we would integrate with CARES, I think that would bump up the priority list and I'd love to do that. Or you can just reach out directly to CARES um, and, um, <clears throat> and tell them that you wish that they would integrate with us, but it's probably easier just to coordinate it through me and we'll work with them. They're, they're good folks over there. There's just a lot going on and, and like everybody, they have to triage and prioritize. That sounds good. That sounds good. And one of the things that was, I think it was Rick Farron uh, mentioned that with the cornucopia of symptoms uh, that are associated with COVID, we used to say it was, you know, respiratory and fever was the trigger. And, uh, and actually there was a, a study published day before yesterday about uh, ophthalmologic complaints of conjunctivitis being uh, the only first complaint for people showing up at the emergency department with people who had um, serious uh, COVID complications later on. There's the COVID toes and GI stuff and strokes and chest pain and the and the the symptom presentation is is wide and so one of the things he uh, uh, suggested is that um, having a, a trigger um, with three or more calls uh, to the same address for anything um, has really uh, been helpful for their uh, their surveillance and Todd I don't know with your <coughs> work on this or Deb if you have any uh, any, any additional thoughts to, to that or any additional ways to kind of pay attention to things as this, uh, as this crazy virus evolves? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, it, it, it is presenting in a lot of ways and it's usually helpful in most systems to know about those, um, you know, returns to the same address anyway. Uh, we have a, 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 a quite a few either frequent address or frequent patient triggers that we can use all kinds of criteria, including just the address down to the apartment number or a combination of the address uh, and you know, name and information from the electronic patient care records. We've actually have a, have a, a brilliant fellow who works with us, a part-time data scientist named Bokar. And uh, uh, Bokar has been working a lot on um, you know, doing an even better job of matching uh, frequent patients, uh, both from within the same electronic patient care record system uh, or for uh, regions like the National Capital Region, where almost everybody around the National Capital Region has first watch and first pass, um, to be able to look at data from multiple systems and agencies to go through it and then use that same functionality as we get more and more connectivity to hospital outcome data to tie those patients together uh, as well. So a um, lot of ways to look at that. I, just a little tip, um, if you do this on your own with your own, own information from addresses, you just gotta make sure you 
uh, put in the ability to exclude addresses like the Salvation Army or shelters uh, or things like that that you get a lot of calls to because otherwise you'll just drive your people crazy telling them they're having a lot of calls at a place they know they have a lot of calls. So this will be an easy one for you to answer. This is from Julie. It says, can First Watch integrate with uh, the Zucher Central Square CAD? Um, yeah, I, I don't think we have integrated with the Zerker one. We've integrated with several of the other Central Square uh, systems, um, but I could be wrong because uh, we're integrated with a lot right now. But yes, basically, if the data is available in, in SQL Server or Oracle or any kind of database that we can connect to, uh, we can do that. And if anybody in the First Watch team is listening and we have integrated with um, Zerker CAD, and I just, I'm not remembering right now, please let us know, but I'm, I'm sure we can. That sounds good. That sounds good. And, and, and Dave Murphy, you asked a question. He said, so what was the time frame? I'm, I'm, since I'm, I'm looking at three different list, lists of questions, I'm not sure what, what the time frame question was you were related to. So can you, can you give me a little more information and then I can ask your question there? Um, in the meantime, you know, one of the things I noticed uh, looking through uh, the fears list that people put up at the very beginning of this, um, mm -hmm. there were a whole lot of uh, issues uh, related to like uh, PPE fatigue and uh, uh, PPE supply chain use and issues. Um, one that one that came up that I, 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 I know I saw recently is a big uh, uh, controversial Facebook chat um, was about uh, compliance of employees with uh, mask usage and um, basically uh, virus uh, transmission prevention strategies when they're off duty. Um, I, and I, you know, we don't necessarily need to to totally unpack that, but it was just it's interesting. Of you know, if part of our role is to make sure we protect our employees and our patients and part of protecting patients, you know, during flu season is, you know, when I, when I ran an operation, it's like you either get a flu shot or you wear a mask throughout all flu season because you might be uh, contagious and you might be infecting uh, patients. Um, and so as th this thread kind of started with, you know, hey, I've got folks that, yeah, they follow the PPE on duty, but they're, you know, they're really um, avid anti-maskers when they're not at work. And, and their Facebook feed shows them in all kinds of really unsafe situations, including one place where they attended one of the COVID parties. And then wow. they're coming into, coming into work the next day and, and trying to figure out how to, how to deal with that. It's really interesting. Yeah, I know, I know Scott Moore and, and other people have been doing a ton of good, uh, good work um, on, on a lot of questions like that. And I, you know, I, I definitely don't, don't claim to know and be an expert on that. Um, two thoughts come into my head besides Scott. Um, one of them is take it out of the COVID context. And, and if you, you know, somebody reported that one of your employees, um, you know, was, you know, posting, you know, drunk videos at a bar two hours before they uh, showed up for a shift, um, you would have to act. And, 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 you know, it's not really, I mean, it, it's become political, but the virus doesn't care what your politics are. So that's one thing. I do know that at, uh, in sort of the beginning of some of this COVID work, I was asked to help uh, Sandia Labs in New Mexico, uh, their, their, their group there in New Mexico, with uh, um, really a... Um, a model to create a model about risk and PPE and you know what if you for example one one simple part of it was what if you tested um, you know once a shift for temperature uh, uh, and symptoms versus at the beginning and the end of the shift versus if you tested you know in between you know calls that reduce your risk and they modeled all the way out to uh, um, you know, the number of patients and providers who would likely die based upon that. And I think that, you know, knowledge is our best, um, you know, um, uh, argument here, um, you know, with, with, uh, with it as political as it's gotten. Uh, it's also tough because people are busy trying to fill spots. And, you know, if you if you got rid of everybody who feels like they shouldn't wear a mask out in the out in the, the you know the, their civilian life, 
um, there are a lot of people that might not be able to staff their units. And, you know, this is, this is for me, um, you know, two things really, Ray Bereshansky said this morning, you know, that he, that he got, that he heard this quote from somebody else, but we're in a marathon of sprints. I love that. That seems so applicable. But the other thing is, is 2020 for me seems like it's really wrapped around a whole ton of problems for which there is not a clear right answer. It's, you know, it's either just really unclear or there's not a good answer at all and you're just choosing the least worst thing. Um, and I think that's part of what this Sandia model, and unfortunately, um, you know, they, they have a lot of, of hoops to jump through to make that model available. Uh, but if this continues for a while, uh, perhaps it might get done. But I work with a great guy named Pat Finley uh, there and, uh, and, and a team of people uh, really sharing this kind of thing as far as what are those uh, variables that come up. Thank you for that, Todd. I, I, it's a, this is a very dynamic, complex and evolving kind of thing. And I, you know, I think um, your dad taught me if you put patients at the center, you'll make better decisions. And, yep. I, and, I, and I think that, at least for me, that's always where I start. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things. So, uh, uh, David, thank you. It was the COVID address trigger. Um, so, three or more calls to an address over what kind of time period. Do you have any thoughts on that one, Todd? Or? Yeah. So, um, a couple of things. A fair number of our agencies already have something like that covered with, um, you know, what they'll call like a rekindle type trigger. And so it's not a COVID specific or even a frequent patient trigger. It's more of, hey, I went to go pick up somebody at this address and then I went back again, either because I didn't transport them, they were released from the ER and sent back home when they maybe shouldn't have been. But so people will watch for that. So I think there are different reasons to track different things. And that rekindle, uh, that uh, uh, friend of ours, Bruce Evans, um, use that name from the from the fire service side when the fire will restart. Uh, same thing uh, where you know we want to go find that out. So you might look at a short time period. Um, you know that's often uh, 48 hours. Uh, some people will do 24 hours. Part of it depends on your system and your tolerance for alerts, because if you get a lot of alerts, you're not going to pay attention to them. So uh, you really have to titrate that to to, to have that make sense. Um, if it's a, you know, really a COVID or flu or something that lasts a long time like that, um, you know, I think you could easily look at it in that same kind of 14 day time frame. Um, but it's really, I haven't heard anybody come up with anything other than this is sort of a theory, as you would say, Mike, for, uh, for, for how that, you know, how that really works. And, and um, you know, I can, I can make a pretty good argument for anything from two hours to 30 days, depending on what question they might be trying to answer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Jeff Martin uh, uh, jumped in and, and uh, in the, in the question section, and he, he basically said for, for those of you that are having uh, um, cares integration uh, desires, first watch created a trigger for him um, that grabs cares calls and pulls out things that we have to enter into an audit to make it easy uh, to have the PCRs and CAD data. Uh, on the same line. Um, also pulling hands on chest time from CAD when available, made our CARES data much cleaner and uh, much more representative. And uh, so Jeff, thank you for, uh, for sharing that perspective. Um, and let me think here. I think we have, uh, uh, you know, the only other, the only other thing that um, <coughs> a couple of the, the fears kind of foreshadow and we, we talked about this a little bit during the opening session this morning, um, has to do with um, your uh, staffing, scheduling, and your kind of HR supply chain. And, um, you know, thinking about from the, from the data perspective, um, and one of the things, I know Scott uh, Dorsey is, uh, is on the line with us here, and, uh, and uh, so is, uh, is Alan from uh, Montgomery County. Um, and and they there are a couple of a couple of our customers that have done a really uh, you know good job of of kind of using the data data leadership mindset to think about you know you know what are my monitoring my sick time stuff monitoring my you know vacation request changes um, and and doing scenario planning so uh, Scott and his team did this 
whole scenario planning, you know, up to the point where 40 or 50 percent of his workforce was either sick or quarantined and, uh, and una unable to staff and what um, changes to the demand analysis and the system status plan and staffing and stations and all that kind of stuff that he would do based on those kinds of things. So um, it's so it's so hard to predict um, exactly what's going to happen. Um, you know, some places uh, in New York City, the cardiac arrest uh, rate uh, doubled. Pam Lai and, and the team from FDNY published a, uh, a study on that just recently. Um, but our colleagues in Seattle were like, the cardiac arrest rate didn't change at all. Um, so it, 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 there's something about really kind of grabbing on to your own data from your own system and being able to display it so that you can consume it as near real time as you can to help you kind of manage what's happening right now and have some, have some ways to kind of say, well, what if this happens? What do I think I'll need to adjust so you can do a little bit of kind of scenario planning, even though even though prediction is hard in this in this crazy time. Um, I think that. Uh, Mike, that uh, Mike, just real quick, you mentioned uh, Scott Dorsey in Snohomish County. One of the things on our website, which is one of my favorite things uh, that I've seen in a long time, is uh, Snohomish County's COVID nineteen procedure manual. So if you're not part of the health intelligence. Uh, on page and haven't been on the Paramount Chiefs of Canada calls, I'd encourage you to go visit this page, firstwatch.net forward slash H-I forward slash SNOCO, S-N-O-C-O. -O. Um, but what they've done is they have uh, created these uh, procedure manuals that are in PowerPoint. Um, and then also there they have decentralized their decontamination for their PPE so they can do it at uh, separate stations. Uh, and they've really done a, a, just a fabulous job. As soon as it loads up on my screen, I'll, I'll bring it over. But they actually use a uh, human factors approach uh, for this. And it's one of the easier things I have seen to, uh, to, to find and use. And, and uh, if you're interested, you can just go download it. They've made it available for and anybody. The, and we are at the end of our time oh. together today. I so I want to thank everybody who's joined. Deb? Todd, any last words before we uh, uh, turn things back over to, uh, to Anthony? No, I think we're good. Thank you very much. Yeah. I had set my timer wrong here. Thank you for saving yeah. me. Yeah, thanks everyone. That's great. Well, Todd, Debbie, Mike, thank you all so much. Uh, and please make sure and pass on our well wishes to Dave. It's good to hear that he's doing better. Uh, we're, we're all very relieved and, and hope he continues to make a great recovery. Uh, I've got to say this has been great for me because usually I am uh, the guy that's running around like the chicken with my head cut off right about now at Pinnacle, and I never get the opportunity to, uh, to attend the First Watch user group meeting. So this is, it's been informative, it's been insightful, and I really enjoyed it. I hope all the participants uh, that, that joined us today uh, did as much as I did. So uh, thank you guys so much. Again, we, we greatly appreciate your sponsorship of Pinnacle. Uh, and we look forward to uh, many, many more years of, of Pinnacle experiences with you guys as we announced the future dates. And then we know that First Watch looks forward to being part of those when we, when we get back together again. So thank, thank you, you guys. Um, thank you all so much for uh, for attending Virtual Pinnacle, for attending the First Watch user group meeting this afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day.